Moving forward, may I now request Mr. Ratul Puri, Chairman Hindustan Power Projects, to please join us on the dais and address the audience. Let's put our hands together for him. Thank you very much, Deepak, for uh, that very nice opening, uh, those very nice opening remarks. Honorable Minister, all members in the audience, a very warm welcome to you. I want to thank the Economic Times for organizing this conference. You know, these are truly exciting times for India. How much of a difference one year has made. I was uh, in Singapore recently and I met some fund managers and, you know, the dramatic shift in mood I've seen, you know, since the coming in of the new government, since the changes that have taken place, since the commitment to reform that we are seeing, since the development-oriented agenda we have seen. Twelve months ago, I think, you know, globally, everyone was almost writing India off. I think today, suddenly, everyone is looking at India as, you know, the next major economy in the world, the next China. You know, everyone is, is India, I think, once again, is in the limelight. I truly believe that India has a unique opportunity over the next few decades to become one of the leading economies of the world and thereby significantly improving the quality of life of a billion people. Um, you know, I think all of us sitting over here have a reasonably good quality of life, but the reality is the majority of Indians have a very, very poor quality of life. And I think, you know, we all need to work towards ensuring that, they all, that the quality of life of the majority of Indians improves significantly. I think there's a unique confluence of, of events, both global and local, that have come together to create this, what I believe is once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for India. I think, firstly, uh, the aging of advanced economies. I think we're seeing aging populations in advanced economies. The one-child policy in China, which even though China is not an advanced economy, I think the one-child policy in China has aged China prematurely. Combined with India's demographic dividend, creates an opportunity where we, have, we will have 15 million people exiting the workforce globally and 10 million people entering the workforce in India each year for, from here for the next two decades. I think that's a unique opportunity and never, uh, an opportunity that's never happened before. This combined with some more short-term events, the, the falling of global oil prices, I think you know, the halving of oil prices that has happened and I personally believe you know, in the near future you know, oil is going to remain relatively low. So the halving of oil prices combined with the fact that the world is awash in liquidity, you know, creates a unique opportunity for India to go ahead and build out our economy significantly, develop our economy over the next 5, 10, 15 years. The world is, is today rich in energy and rich in capital. India has historically and continues to be poor in energy, poor in capital. So again, you have a confluence of events that allows India to become possibly the factory to the world. Adding to these global factors, I believe, after a long period, we have a government in place that has a mandate, and a mandate that's based and driven by development. And I think that puts in a tremendous pressure on the government to deliver on that mandate, to deliver on better days for the people of this country. We also have the benefit of a dynamic leader who has demonstrated his ability to deliver on development. As I said earlier, these are truly exciting times for India. But there are many challenges ahead of us. The skilling of the 10 million people that enter the workforce. If we don't skill these 10 million people, they are not employable, which means we don't have the people to put into the factories and the service centers that are needed to drive economic growth. Building out India's physical infrastructure, and most importantly, creating the right governance framework. I think the list is long, but the one area that I believe India will face one of the biggest challenges is the, deliver, is the ability to deliver the growth needed in electricity supply, not just to meet the, the, the very, very ambitious 24-7 promise of the government, but also to deliver reliable energy for manufacturing plants, software development centers, schools, malls, all the components of a rapidly developing economy. I think the sector faces many challenges. Deepak spoke to some of them. I think all of us sitting in this room are well aware of them coal gas supply, rail linkages, stranded generating assets, you know, I think the list goes on and on. I think Minister Goyal inherited, you know, a lot of very, very difficult challenges, you know, which he's been working on addressing. I think I'd like to talk about two or three areas that I believe are very crucial, not, not necessarily in the immediate term, but, you know, as we get out to the medium and long term. The first is the lack of development of greenfield capacity. 
I think for the last three years, there has been limited development of greenfield capacity in the sector. I think most players in the sector have focused upon building exist bringing existing assets into operation and probably correctly so. I also believe considering the current challenges the sector is going through, there's going to be limited development over the next two years. This will leave a period starting 2018 onwards where there's going to be very, very limited amount of incremental thermal generation capacity that's going to come on stream. And this will coincide with a period of rapid economic growth as the policies of the government, current government start to take effect, as low interest rates start to take effect. We all hope and wish that the economy will be roaring at that time. I think that's going to be a major challenge for India. And effective and electricity can become the bottleneck beyond 2018 for India unless we don't take some steps today. Especially to build investor confidence. I think investor confidence in the sector has been you know, shattered today. On the other hand, I believe this actually creates an opportunity for India. And that opportunity is the fact that we can now build out a modern energy architecture. I think we are seeing a massive change globally around uh, the designing of energy architecture, distributed generation, renewables. So I believe this creates an opportunity for us to put a far more significant focus on renewables. I believe coal thermal has to be always the backbone of our power generation. But in terms of incremental capacity addition, renewables have to play a much more significant role. And that's the one tool I believe the government has available because it takes us only one or two years to develop a renewable asset, whereas it, you know, the cycle to develop a coal asset is fairly long. I also believe it's important for us to build policies to focus on energy conservation. I think we can build these into our policies today, build these, build, build these into our energy architecture today. The second area I'd like to focus upon is on finan the financial health of our distribution companies. A supply chain is as, as weak as its weakest link and you know, we today truly have a challenge as we look towards the financial health of our distribution companies. We have a very unique situation, a dichotomy, where we have stranded generation capacity on one hand and we are willing consumers on the other. And we have to some extent a dysfunctional intermediary that is not connecting both of them. This has resulted in our building out close to 70 gigawatts amongst the world's largest small sized, you know, small petrol, kerosene, diesel generating sets, you know, which costs are the consumers of this country three times more than the cost of conventional energy, besides having horrible impact on our health and environment. I think all of us, you know, every time those diesel generators in and around our homes fire up, uh, you know, besides the noise pollution, you know, we have all the sulfur and everything else that goes into the air. I think the third big challenge the sector has got is ensuring capital availability. As we look towards the 13th, 15 year, 13th five year plan, and if the economy does grow at the pace at which we all hope it is going to grow, we will need somewhere in the range of $200 billion of investment in the sector in the 13th five year plan. You know, that will require, besides equity, that will require about 10 lakh crores of debt that will be needed to be taken on in order to, to, to effectively build out the transmission infrastructure, distribution infrastructure, develop the coal mines, build the 100 gigawatts of, of solar, build out you know, all the incremental coal thermal capacity. I was looking at this number yesterday, the cumulative outstanding credit of the Indian banking system today towards large borrowers, which I think most, most players in the past sector uh, 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 would constitute a large borrower, is 20 lakh crore. This is the cumulative outstanding. I don't believe the current banking system without significant policy intervention will be in a position to meet this challenge. So I believe we have a dire and immediate need to, to create vehicles and methodologies to take out some of the debt from the banking system and to create alternate means of financing for developers. I think the Infrastructure Investment Trust is an exceptionally good vehicle and I believe many more such vehicles that allow infrastructure companies to directly access consumer credit, consumer uh, capital uh, are crucial to be able to ensuring the continued growth in the sector. Before finishing, I thought I would take this opportunity to thank and congratulate, thank on behalf of the sector and congratulate uh, Minister Goyal for the decisive and bold manner in which uh, he and his government have, have worked upon addressing the challenges of the sector. 
I think you know, this government has been hit very quickly with a rapid succession of issues, the Supreme Court verdict, the coal strike, I think many other very, very difficult issues to deal with. And you know, at least as an observer sitting outside, uh, even though sometimes those policies and ideas have not necessarily benefited our company, but I believe they have done the right things for the sector and for the country. Needless to say, there is still a long way to go to bring investor confidence back and attract significant investment in the sector. Without sounding cliched, I'd like to tell the Honorable Minister that it's not just the fate of the stakeholders in this sector that are in his hands, but the future of a billion people depend on the actions that this government will take you know, over the next uh, you know, one year, two years, three years. Because we can only have Achyadin in a powerful India. Thank you very much.